Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. I hope you have your cup of tea, your coffee, water, juice, or whatever you're drinking. It is now time for our keynote presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, Old Ways Won't Open New Doors, our keynote presentation, ladies and gentlemen. An acclaimed author of children's book, David Bouchard, is also a champion of literacy. This former teacher and school principal has written more than 70 books in English, in French, and in several indigenous languages. Many combine poetry, prose, and visual arts, and explore topics such as environment, history, and the traditions and cultures of Canada indigenous communities. Into, in April 2009, Bouchard was named a member of Order of Canada for his contribution as an author of children's books and an advocate who has championed the cause of reading and writing and who has shared his pride as a member of the Métis community through his stories. In 2017, David was again honored the Queen's University where he was awarded the Honorary Doctorate in Law. David lives in Victoria, B.C. with his wife Vicky and their daughter Victoria. And in two December 2018, their family grew by one with the arrival of Isabel Bouchard. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm proud to announce and welcome the myth. The guy is so cool, ladies and gentlemen. I love that. I was speaking with him earlier and he sounds like a cool guy. So ladies and gentlemen, our keynote present presenter, David Bouchard. Welcome, David. Yeah, thanks, Brent. <laughs> you're oh the my best. goodness, you're three hours. You're three hours behind us. You're, it's like seven thirty right now, a quarter to eight right now. Yeah, can you believe it? Yeah, my goodness. It's a big country. Oh yes. How's the weather right now? Um, well, we've had snow once this year, Brent, which is why I'm here. I'm from Saskatchewan, and the less snow I see, the better. So it's beautiful. There's hummingbirds out there. The flowers are budding, and I know you don't want to hear that, but then we don't have Persian men, so I have every right to it. <laughs> and let me say very quickly before you leave, and I know you will leave, yeah. the president uh, of uh, Ukraine is uh, is an actor and an amazing, an yeah. amazing person. And I've, 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 when I look at him, I think every child should try to become an actor. It just adds a whole layer of. And when I hear you talk, I think every student should strive towards becoming an MC because it adds a layer of confidence and it lets you express yourself the way. And, you know, I, every time I hear someone like you and you do it with spades that I guess it's humor, but it's more than that. It's a, it's a, an element of, of confidence and, and pride. And yeah. so <laughs> good for you, Brent. Thanks. Thank you. I just want to point out to you that the uh, mayor of Kiev. Yeah, he's a former box, former champion boxer. Yeah, Ukraine is full of talent. That's oh, that's it is absolutely. Yeah. Yep. All right, Bouchard, take Thanks. it away. Okay, you go get your coffee. Okay, good morning, folks. Um, I'd like to start very, very quickly by um, with the land recognition. After which, I'm going to invite the residential school children who were who were murdered to join us for this period of time, and then I'd like to speak briefly to mental health. And then if you'll allow me, I'm going to very, very quickly speak to the fact that we have to uh, start to focus on our students much more than on the curriculum, and thus every child is special. So very quickly, I'm coming to you from, from the lands of Luke Quaggan. I'm from Saskatchewan, um, and I've been living here in this non-ceded territory for over 20 years. The Luke Quaggan nations comprise both the Esquimalt people of the West Coast and the Songhees, and their land is spectacular. And if there's anyone among you, and I know there are some educators who are non-Indigenous who would want to reflect on that, it simply means that Canadians came in and took the land. And we know that we owe them big time. So whenever I do anything on their land, I do it with sincere uh, recognition of where I am. And I try to put back everything I've taken. And that's the room that I'm in. I'm in my shack. I call it a shack. If I were younger, if I were Brent's age, I'd say this is my man cave. But I'm not. I call it a shack. I'm from Saskatchewan. It would be a shack or a shed. And in Quebec, it would be in Caban. So this is what it looks like. It was an old garage, by the way, just completely falling down. And I needed a place to work. So I, I got some uh, some shiplap from a house being torn down. And I threw that on the ceiling of the, this garage. And then on the walls, you can see that uh, my flutes, they're not pipes, they're flutes. And they're, all of those bookshelves are recycled wood and the walls are recycled cedar. And the paintings are all from my books there. I, I collect them as you can imagine. Again, you can see the beams and you work your way over. Those beautiful doors are from Facebook Marketplace, the chair, Facebook Marketplace, as is the couch. Oh, the links, I'm not a hunter. It's from Northern Quebec. I traded it with Indianica in Montreal for some books. And then if you work your way over, the Martin is my clan as a, an Ojibwe Métis. The Ojibwe people said, uh, you Frenchmen, we have to put you, you need a clan for your kids to, to be part of. And we're going to make you the, the Martin clan because they like to fight. They love the water. Again, the, the stove uh, Facebook marketplace, as you go along, absolute, well, not the TV. The TV I had when Donald Trump was president, I used it for comic relief. And now I use it for the Raptors. And uh, if you keep going, you'll see more flutes and you'll see 
the shock I've done completely uh, in um, I, in recycled product, just to, I think to make sure that I was being fair to the community and trying to give back what, I, what I've used. That was the first thing. Second thing I'd like to do is I'd like to invite those children who, uh, who were, were murdered in residential schools whose bodies we continue to find. And I don't mind telling that whenever I'm given a chance, I say, if I were the prime minister of this country, I would say, I would mandate, I make it law that every newspaper in our country put an orange banner in the top left-hand corner, the left because my heart is on the left, the number count, the numbers that we're at, and let every Canadian see that every day. It should be there. It should be front, right, and center on every newspaper. They're there. I mean, their bodies are being found, are being located, but their spirits, where are they? And I believe that they're among us. I believe that they're with my mom and dad and my, my grandparents and my ancestors among the stars. And I'd like to invite them to join us for this time. And I will do that through the universal language of, of, of song. It's, it's my own flute. It's a song that I wrote when my late mother was, was, uh, was dying. It's my healing song and it's my invitation song. So I say this, uh, children, come and join us. It's only gonna be a few minutes and there will be a story in this for you. That invitation being done, um, I would like to very, very, oh, I, I almost forgot to, it's the International uh, Inter International Women's Day. And we know, uh, not only as Indigenous people, we know as, as people who have learned and watched and see that it was a better world uh, in every sense when it was run by, by women. And in most of our communities, our women remain the, the staple of our families and our communities. And, and this conference can't help but do well, I think almost all of the organizers that I met are women, starting with Kathy, working all the way through, and, and so you know it's in good hands. And I challenge you with this. Do you think that the, the atrocities that are taking place presently in Ukraine, would, in Ukraine would be happening if there was a president of Russia uh, that was a woman? No. It, and it's changing. I mean, we can see that that movement is happening. You know. Anyway, happy uh, International Women's Day. To me, uh, there should be a day that's International Men's Day, and every other day should be a Women's Day, which is kind of the way it is anyway. I'd like to very, very quickly speak to mental health. Um, educators and students, we are not trained as teachers and administrators to deal with mental health, or at least we weren't when I went through and I have a master's degree on it and distinction and not once did anybody ever say to me, by the way, this is the definition of mental health. If ever you see a student doing this, you it didn't happen. We were not trained. Subsequent to that, there's all kinds of kids who under my watch, we're not well provided for. I wanna make this perfectly clear. Our world has evolved, has changed. And when my wife says to me, no, no, I think those mental health issues were relevant when we were younger. Well, I don't think they were. I think that social media has put a whole pack of pressure on students to see that they should be this, they could be this. I think that it's become a lot more prominent. And frankly, if you went into your home situations and said, how many of you students have somebody who wakes up every morning and takes a pill, not for a physical ailment, but for a mental ailment, half of the students, I'm not kidding you. I do it all the time. Half, 70%. We, somebody in my home takes one. In my home, we were three adults and two take pills for mental health related issues. And my son, Etienne, yes, Adrian, it goes on and on. We should know and we should recognize because we're dealing with the best generation the world's ever seen. We have to tell them it's real. We have to try to lead them on the path while they discover what mental health is. All right, my little girl was a very, very strong academic student and she came home in grade 11 and she said, dad, can I stay home? And I said, of course, why, what's, what's the deal? And she said, look at my arms. And they were covered with red blisters. And I said, what happened? She said, feel my sweater. It was soaked with sweat. And I said, babe, what's going on? And she said, every day when the teacher comes in and stares at me, I think that he's staring right through me. Dad, I feel like I'm on an elevator. Please, can I stay home? And I said, of course you can. It took me a week to get her to a doctor and they referred us to a psychiatrist. And we sat across the desk from a psychiatrist who looked at us and said, Victoria, you're a beautiful 17 year old girl. Do you have friends? And my daughter said, yes, I have tons of friends. Do you go to parties? And my daughter looked at her and said, Dad, and no, I don't. Mm. Do you like shopping? Yeah, sure. And if, you're, if your dad gives you his visa card and says, go buy something, would you? No. What about restaurants? 
And my little girl said, I know what you want me to say. And it's true. If there's somebody in the restaurant that I know, I won't go in. And if there's nobody I know, I'll go in. And the psychiatrist said, you suffer from a social anxiety disorder, Victoria, and you need help. I'm going to put you in a little pill called Ciprolex, and I'm going to talk to your mom and dad. And she said to me, if it takes her a month to come out of her bedroom, leave her. If it takes her six, leave her. She's 23, and she's still kind of in her bedroom. When she was 19, I was speaking at a conference in Toronto, and Vicky called and said, would you like to know what your daughter just did? And I said, is she all right? And she said, she's more than all right, David. She got in the bus, and she went downtown on her own. She she went to Value Village and bought something on her own. She paid for it on her own. She came back on the bus on her own. And when she was done talking, I realized I was crying. And that is mental health. It is so real. Students, if ever you see someone doing something a little off track, never look at them and say, what's wrong with you? Look at them instead and say, is there something wrong? Is there a way I can help? It's that real. All right. And finally, I'd like to share this one last thought with you, please. Every one of you is unique. Every single person is unique. There's only one of you in the whole world and every student has the right and the responsibility to go home tonight, look in the mirror and say, I love you. You're not too short, you're not too tall, you're not too thin, you're not too heavy. You're perfect, you're one of a kind and I know that I'm the only you there'll ever be and I'm so, so lucky. They have that right and that responsibility. But unfortunately and sadly, we in our school systems and in our community, have got them thinking something other. Do you know what we do in Canada? We say, hey kids, if you're gonna succeed, you see that girl up there? Girls, you should try to look like her. And a young woman might say, oh, and I, my body is nothing like that. I know, but we can change that. And we've got ways today. And you should dress like that. Somebody might say, I can't afford those clothes. I know that's your purpose in life. You try to make enough money and then you can buy. And you see that car? You want that car. And you want a house with a double garage like that double garage or a three-car garage. We tell our students to look up there for success. And we have been so wrong. It's time we change that. That's not where they look. They look in there. Look in there. Creator has given you a gift. You figure out what that gift is and you fall in love with you. And you build your whole life around that gift. You might never get rich, although you might. You might never get famous, you might, but I promise you this, when you're a Kodkum or a Mushum sitting back on, on your terrace and thinking, ah, oh, yeah, I did a good job of my life. You learn to be honest with yourself as Raven would have you be. That's very, very important, very important. And we've not done that, letting people become who they are. All right, that was what I wanted to share with you. And now we'll get into this. I'd like to thank Dan for allowing me to be part of this. It's a, it's a real honor for me. It's been a while since I've been to the North, but I have to tell you that since COVID, I've had a chance to work with tons of schools and parent groups and, and classrooms through social media. All of a sudden, people like me, authors like me are affordable. You can just say, hey, David, you want to hook up and we'll spend a half an hour together. And I've been doing that just 24 seven, every day, I do things online. And that's a bonus because to the far North, and I've been very far north for big periods of time. You can't get there without great expense. And so these kids don't get that opportunity. But finally, we're changing things. And that's good news. So what I'd like to do now that I've done A, a land recognition. B, I've invited the children to join us. And then I spoke briefly about mental health. And then the third thing that was very important to me is that I want people to know that we have to focus on the gift we've been given. I'm going to share a book with you. But before I do that, keep in mind that I'm a storyteller. So there's no slowing me down. A little bit like Brent, give me a microphone and try stopping me. It's hard. You need somebody pulling me off saying, I'm going to give you a chance for questions and, and comments uh, towards the end of my time with you. But before we do that, two very quick stories to, to talk about how th this time of change, there is a big time of change, it's COVID and, but I have to I think we have to take the plant by the roots and kind of pull it, pull it up by the roots, pull it up and do things differently. It's time that we, rethink how we're doing and why we're doing. And I'd like to share one quick story with you. Of course, you know, as an indigenous man, I would never tell you a story that was not my story unless I would say, they say, they say, I heard. But these are stories that I can tell you because I lived it. These are truths, my truths, my story. They wanted me to go to Old Crow. It's the only Arctic community in the Yukon. Old Crow uh, in, the, in the Yukon, in the Arctic. It's 320 souls, people that live there. And I was, I was thrilled because I had never been there. So I flew from Victoria to Vancouver, Vancouver to Edmonton, Edmonton to White, Whitehorse. I flew over to Dawson City, up to Takayaktak and flipped into Old Crow. 
And when I got there, it was minus 47. And I know it's when you when it's minus 35 or 47 or 70, it's just cold. But I got out and their airport is like a little shack with a stove in it. And I stood outside minus 47. And with the wind chill, it was 56 or something. I was wearing my parka and doing those things that you do just before you die. So I was doing this and all of a sudden a skidoo, a, uh, a snowmobile pulled up in front of me. And this guy jumped off and took off his tooth and looked at me and said, hey, are you the author? And I looked around. I mean, there was nobody for 5,000 miles. What do you think? And he kind of laughed and he said, hey, I'm Danny. I'm Gwich'in. Put out his hand. I said, I'm David. I'm Métis. And he said, yeah, I know. The admin told me to bring you a snowmobile. So that's why I'm here. And I said, okay, Danny, well, where is it? He said, it's the green one right there. And I said, do I need any keys, any instructions? Do I need anything? He said, oh, you know, you don't even have to, man. It's broken. It doesn't work. I said, what do you mean it doesn't work? He said, it doesn't work. I said, well, how did you get it here? He said, we've got two trucks in the village. I brought it in one of the trucks. I said, Danny, this might seem stupid, but if it doesn't work, why'd you bring it? He said, the admin asked me to bring one and I, I didn't want to argue. So there it is. I said, have you got a plan B? Because I'm good for about five more minutes before I die. And he said, well, we could get a truck. And I said, where is it? He said, just around the corner. I said, can you hurry? Okay, five minutes later, I'm driving down in Old Crow, by the way, 230 people. And there's no roads because there's no cars, right? It's snowmobiles and little four by fours. And so driving down, I said, Danny, is this your home? Yeah, born and raised, been my whole life here. And I said, are you married? Do you have a family? Uh, yeah, I am divorced. And I said, ooh, that's got to be hard in a little town like this. What do you mean? I said, well, I mean, you know, you're always being each other's faces, wouldn't you? What do you mean? I said, Danny, what do you mean? What I mean, where does your ex-wife live? And he said, you see that blue house? That's her house. And I said, and you? He said, this is this white one. That's where I live. I said, that's what I mean. Wouldn't you be in each other's faces? I oh, forget it. And he said, ah, no matter. And I said, have you ever had another girlfriend or relationship? Or is he? Or, and he said, oh, yeah, I met a nurse who came up a couple of years ago. And, oh, man, we really hit it off. She was. And so she went and rented us an apartment in Toronto. And I said, two years ago, but you're still here. He said, yeah, I, I changed my mind. I said, oh, she wasn't the girl for you? And he said, oh, no, I mean, she was she was awesome. She was perfect, but it's like Toronto. Who would want to live in Toronto? Danny was living in poverty. He had no teeth. He was 50 years old, extremely handsome, and he had to go out every day and get snow and melt it for water. And I'm not kidding you. Literally a month later, I'm speaking in Mississauga, Ontario, and I had all of the board, the trustees in front of me. And the first thing I said is, by the way, I want all of you to know that as you work with these students and you build an educational program around these students, I want all of you to know this. Not every one of those kids that you're working with wants to live in Rosedale in Toronto, wants to drive a Mercedes Benz and wants to dress with Ralph Lauren Double RL. I know a guy. His name is Danny. He's Gwich'in. He lives in Oak Crow. And I told them the story and they looked at me and I said, so don't think that the goal that you've got to create for everybody is that they want what you want because it's not the case. It's not the case. I want to grow up where my family is around my children. I want to stay with my children. I don't want to go to New York City or Boston. I want to be here with my Isabel, my granddaughter. That's the way it is. And they listened. That's the first lesson I want all of you to think about is that as we create this magical system to allow students to, maybe we don't want to do that. Talk to their parents. That's the source of the knowledge. Talk to their grandparents. That's the source of all things right. Then they flew me to, and this is another one, and students, you'll want to pick up on this one. This is mainly for you. They flew me to, uh, to uh, Callowit, uh, the capital of, uh, of Nunavut. Oh, are you ready to learn something new? So when the day is over, you say, I learned something from Bouchard. Did you know that in the Calouet, you get into a cab, into a taxi, and no matter where you go, you give the driver $7 in the city, of course. And if there's two people, seven and seven. If there's three, seven and seven and seven. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Okay. They flew me from a up to Arctic Bay. Arctic Bay is the second most Northern community in Canada. And of course it was cold. There's 700 people there. They're, uh, they're Inuit and their language is Inuktitut. And when I arrived in Arctic Bay, I was going to work with the students in the school and with parents and teachers. And the first thing I had a chance to do is speak with, with students that from kindergarten to, uh, I guess, about grade six. And I started to speak and the teacher said, David, can you slow down? I'm translating. And I said, hey, you could. Madame, attendez, c'est français. Je peux faire aussi à cinéma français. I can do it in French. That's my first language. She said, no, silly. It's not French. It's an Uktatuk. These students speak an Uktatuk. And I'm learn they're learning English. So she translated to English. Then I went to the high school 
And when I was working with high school students and I was able to give the teacher a chance for coffee, I said, kids, can I ask you, what are your chances of success? And a beautiful young woman in grade 11 raised her arm and she said, zero, there's not one of us, not one, Mr. Bouchard, who's going to be able to achieve what it takes to get into any university in Canada. And I said, well, why is that? And she said, because we write the same exams that they write in Edmonton and Calgary, and our language is in Uktutuk. And when they, she speaks, she speaks with an accent. It almost sounds like a Mennonite or how to write sound, heavy accent. And I said, you write the same exams, exactly the same exams. And it's not our language and it's not our culture. And we do not pass those exams. So our teachers have to modify our programs in such a way that there's not a university in Canada that would accept me. I said, interesting, interesting. Sweetie, I'm older now and I've been around and I'm telling you this, that's not the case. Is there a drummer among you? And when they drum, they're not like our drummers that, that hand drum, they've got that big round drum and they beat that drum. And as they do, they seek out the heartbeat of mother earth and they jump and they'll do a little bit of a hop and they'll hop in circles. And I said, is there a drummer among you? And a boy in grade 10 said, my name is Vincent, I drum. And they're not at all embarrassed. I mean, he grabbed his drum and he started to drum for me. And a woman, a young girl in maybe grade 12 or 11, started to sing a song in Inuktitut. And he started to dance and drum to the rhythm of the song, to the song that she sang. It was amazing. When he stopped, I was just petrified. Wow, unbelievable. I said, Vincent, that was amazing. And he said, thanks, uh, but uh, Ben is better than me. And I said, oh, he is, is he? And everybody starts nodding their head. And I said, who's Ben? And the boy in grade 12 raised and said, yeah, I'm Ben. And I said, Ben, are you better than that? Yeah, pretty much. I said, do you want to drum? Sure. And he got up and he started to drum. And unbelievable. I said, Ben and Vincent, I want you to listen to me. I'm telling you now that when you leave school, whatever time you don't, whether it's grade 10 or grade 12, or when you leave school, you go to any university in Canada, go to the registrar's office, say, I want to talk to the registrar, say, my name is Vincent. I don't have a grade 12 certificate because I'm from Arctic Bay and we struggle with the language components of that. But I do have my grade 12 from, uh, from our village. It's not a reserve, it's a village. And, we, and uh, I wanted to do a, a master's degree in drumming. And here's what I wanna do. I wanna build a drum and I wanna do part of my degree on building this drum. It's an art that I learned from my grandfather. And after I built the drum, I'm gonna do part of my degree I'm performing. I'm going to be a performing artist because I'm a drummer. I'm going to do part of my degree on performing. And then I want to do part of it on our stories. I'm going to go back into our community and I'm going to ask our elders for our stories. And I'm going to share those stories as part of my degree. And there's not a university in Canada that will refuse you. Our universities are getting a lot better. I said, you listen to me very carefully. You can be a dancer, a drummer, and use those skills you just have to knock on the door and they'll let you in. It turns out students that as you may or may not know, right now there are quotas and universities across Canada are trying to meet a quota to get a certain number of Indigenous students in their programs. I don't know what they are, but I do know that in Victoria, it's fairly substantial. There, I wanted you to hear that story. I wanted you to know that that's how ridiculous our system can be and it's dead wrong. All right, before I, I completely run out of time, my name is Bouchard. I'm an author, which is a riot because I didn't read a book till I was 27. I'm severely dyslexic. I'm not stupid. I'm severely dyslexic. This around my neck is because I love stories. I've always loved stories. And I listen to stories. I literally listen to stories all day long, stories that I can't read. And for those of you who are interested, I read Harry Potter. It's my favorite book of all times. I could read Harry Potter. It was a little bit of work, but I, I read it and I was able to adapt and understand it because it took place in a world that I recognized. Then I tried Lord of the Rings. Oh, no way, man. I couldn't do it. Why? Gandalf, Gandorf, and I was completely lost. Not a clue. The names and the locations just threw me out. Even when I went to the movie, Lord of the Rings, I mean, there were so many bad guys packing a long white beard. If whenever I saw him, I'd say, kill him, just kill him. Unless he had a red toque, in which case I'd say, leave him alone, because who knows, it could be Santa. Santa lives, the other white beards die. I couldn't do Lord of the Rings. I can't read Dan and Brown. I can't read. Uh, I mean, a lot of the stuff that Richard Wagamese has written, I've read, and I've been able to handle um, because I made myself do it at the time. There was no, but whenever there's an audible, I listen to them. 
I listened to 100 books last year, 100 books in one year. I love stories. That to say, so there you go. That's looking at me. I'm, a, I'm a, an author of 74 books and I didn't read a book till I was 27 and reading remains difficult because of my disability. But keep in mind, students, if you have a disability, put that aside. Don't spend your life focusing on what your problem is. Focus on the gift that your creator gave you. Nobody told me that. My whole life, it was, I thought, I just thought I was stupid. I didn't know the alphabet in grade eight. I had to sing it. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. I just thought, oh man, even now as a man, I, I just forget so many things that I know I shouldn't forget. And I think, is there something I should be taking? Is there something? And I have, I have issues. When I have issues, I also have a strength. And you know what my strength is? I think outside of the box. I don't think like other people, like a lot of other people. And when I was a little boy, I got in trouble for doing what I'm doing now, for talking. Because that's the gift my creator gave me. He gave me the gift of storyteller. Do you know what you call a family of crows? A murder. Do you know what you call a family of ravens? A storytelling of ravens. We are storytellers. In kindergarten, my kindergarten teacher looked, I was four years old, four years old. And she said, you want to stop talking? And I looked at her and I said, no, no. Sister, I, I'm, I really like sharing stories. And that's not the answer she wanted to hear. When I was in grade four, teacher looked at me and she said, tais-toi," which is a soft version of shut up. I said, fine. In grade nine, a priest looked at me and said, Bouchard, and that means Bouchard, your mouth, but it's not the mouth of a person, it's the mouth of an animal. And I looked and I th said, oh, to think you're supposed to be my role model. I can't believe it. That's crazy. Not one person ever told me the gift that my creator gave me was the gift of storyteller. I was 46 years old, principal of a school in West Vancouver, and I went home for lunch with my wife and I said, Vicki, I'm doing the wrong job. She said, no, you're not. You're a wonderful principal. I said, creator didn't make me a principal. Creator made me a storyteller. And Vicky said, honey, you're going to retire in six years. You can tell all the stories you want to tell. And I said, I just left the school board office. I quit my job. And she said, you what? I said, I quit my job. I want to be a storyteller. She said, oh, David, for the last 22 years, I've done nothing but follow the genetic direction of my grandmother. She just tells me where to go and when. At that point, I thought, hey, I tattooed that raven on my arm. And every morning when I climb out of the shower, I look heavenly and I say, creator, I'm trying hard to build my life on what I am, not on money, not on my ego, but on the gift you've given me. And let's be clear, every one of our students has a gift. They know when they're four or five years old, either they're athletic, they're good with technology, they're good with people, they're good with animals. It's for us as parents and grandparents and educators to help that student find the gift and focus their life on the gift not on that curriculum that's going to get them into Rosedale and Toronto, but on the gift that they have, and they will live a successful life, period, a full life. We have to allow them to feel good going to school and not feel like, oh, I can't do this, I've got to do this, I can't do this. Why is it that when my son graduated from grade 12 and I was his principal and he walked across the stage, he hung his head and I could read his lips saying, it's over, it's over. It's over. 12 years is over because my son, like me, is dyslexic. And instead of focusing on the fact that he played AAA hockey, gold level soccer, provincial wrestling champion, captain of the rugby team, captain of the drama team, we made him focus on his disability and he ruled out any form of post-secondary education, but he probably could have achieved it. He'd been treated with a bit more respect. It's our whole system has got to sit back and look at what we're doing. That's why I've given you those examples. Now I'd like to apply that a little bit, please, to the classroom and what I think that we as educators and parents and students should focus on. Let's talk truth and reconciliation. Are we ready for the truth? I don't think so. I was invited to a school in Ottawa to middle school. So you're talking grade six, seven, and eights. And they asked me to speak to residential schools. That's easily done. I said, are you sure? Absolutely. Well, there is no gentle way of speaking to residential schools. Tell me a nice way to talk about the Holocaust. There is no nice way of doing that. I didn't tell those students that they found cattle probes at St. Anne's school and they were probing little boys and girls with cattle probes. I didn't tell them that. You know what I dared tell them? We are the only country in the world. Canada is the only country in the world that built cemeteries next to schools when we built our, our residential schools. And oh, did it hit the fan. I mean it. I got a call from the director saying, I don't think you should have said that. 
I said, you asked me to speak to residential schools. What did you want me to do? And he said, well, you know, I think maybe it's, that's a job for their mother or for their parents or for, let's be clear. Do I think we're, that our society is ready for the truth? No. If I was a teacher, would I want to put my neck out in the limb and say, I want to tell you about residential schools when I know it takes one person, one mother, one father, one trustee, one principal, one who doesn't like what I'm doing, and it's my job. I can't feed my children anymore. Are we ready for the truth? I don't think so. So I had to change my way of looking at things, and I thought, okay, rather than fight this demon, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for the real positive elements in who we are as Indigenous people, and I'm going to shove it their way. And if they want it, they've got it. And if they don't, they don't. And thus, I started to focus on some of the, some of the real, real things that makes us as Indigenous people, as me, as an Ojibwe, Osage, Métis, uh, uh, unique. And those things I'm going to build on. How about this one? My most recent book is called Meet Your Family. And it's very short. And what it does is it says, everywhere I travel in the world, we call the earth our mother. Why? Oh, come on, you know why. We come from her, we go to her. If she weren't there, I wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be here. She has given us all life. Me, my dog, that bird, that tree. She's the mother of all of us. That's why we call her Mother Earth. And that's why we have to look to save her and treat her with the respect she deserves. Mother Earth. And if she's my mother, who's my father? Well, me, I was taught by my elders that my father is the sky. When my body came from my Mother Earth, I needed air. And I was given that air from my father, the sky, which is is why I say Mother Earth, Father Sky, Grandfather Sun, who gives my father the energy he needs, Grandmother Moon, who provides my Mother Earth with the feminine and she needs to keep giving new birth. And the stars, all of my relations, my mom and dad are there among those stars, as are my grandparents and my ancestors. And one day I will be there among them where I came from. That's my relationship with the world around me. So I've written a book that's relatively fun. It's a beautiful little book called Meet Your Family. And it's written in English and on the back, it's written in Ojibwe. And if you're interested at all, you'll probably see it on my website. Okay, that aside, I'd like to share this one with you now, because one of the first things I picked up on is that non-Indigenous communities are very anxious to talk about what we are taught, the spirituality that we have, not as, as Catholics or Buddhists or as, as Muslims, but what is it that makes us tick? And we know amongst the Ojibwe that they are the grandfather teachings. And we know that they're different among different peoples. Amongst the Lakota, they're called, um, mm, I've forgotten already. I, on the West Coast, it's called Amhwaks. I know that amongst the Dene, they're called the Dene laws. And there aren't seven, there are 10. The first one, don't run around when, you're, when your elders are eating. And what does that say to me? It says, be respectful of your elders and of those who are weaker than you and of those who have less than you. You show, that's the first, it's respect. And then, uh, so there, these teachings are everywhere. And I thought, hey, I'm gonna focus on those teachings. So I wrote a book in English, in French, in Ojibwe, in Chippewa and Slavey in seven languages, and you can hear it. And by the way, when we're done, if you care to go to my website, my YouTube channel, you'll hear the sequel to that book where I read it to you and you can hear my flutes in the background and it's more of that. So what I'd like to do, I thought, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make the seven sacred teachings in a much more basic form. Let's be real clear. Not everybody can read and read well and get adapted to a book. I want to include as many people as I can in my books. So I'm going to write it with some basic verse, a little rhythm and rhyme. I'm going to use beautiful illustrations. And I'm going to try to get my ideas across as simply as I can, because that's how a person learns to read one book. All you have to do is find one book, close it and say, hey, I just read a book, give me another one. And you can follow that process. That's how you become a reader. Simple as that. Find one book you like and then say, I read it. It doesn't have to, or how thick was it? Who cares? Give me another one. So what I'd like to do now with you is share my seven sacred teachings written in a more basic form that can include elementary, maybe primary students and older students it really speaks to how we, who we, it speaks to us as Indigenous people. So I'm looking at my time and I think I better get into this before I run out of time. I'm going to share my screen and you're going to see my book um, illustrated by um, an Ojibwe Miti uh, from, from Atikokan. And if anybody's not aware, Atikokan is uh, Atikokan, uh, just between Fort Francis and Thunder Bay, and you, I'm sure you know where that is, or most of you know where that mm -hmm. is. Atikokan means the bones of caribou. And I know you can see my screen, mm -hmm. so here we go. 
And it goes like that. I, I chose Christy because I love what she, I love her colors. I love what she does in her art. We learned from the sun, the paintings by Christy Cameron. And I dedicated the book to David James Manson, who at the age of four years old on his reserve in Northern, in Northern BC was shot in the arm by an RCMP during a chase. The, you can still see the bullet and the car hit him and dragged him for a mile. And David James Manson, who's 54 years old today, spent his whole life in hospitals, mainly in hospitals that related to the bleeding in his brain, uh, mental hospitals and in physical, he just, and um, David is a, to me is a real lesson in how we as Canadians really, really have got a lot to do, a lot to grow. We let him down and that little boy should have been taken care of properly and they didn't have the money they needed on the res at the time. Here we go. We learned from the sun. And it starts like this. We are taught how to live, when to take, when to give. From our elders, we learn how the earth and sun turn. And I forgot, I neglected to say a welcome to our elders. So very quickly, I'm sorry that I omitted you. Uh, you are meaning you are a staple in our communities. And we all know that. Thank you for being part of this. So we're taught, how, your elders will tell you this. You don't need teachers or parents or books. Go outside tomorrow morning and look at the sun and learn from the sun. And if I were there with you holding that sun in my hand, as you see in that illustration, I'd say, what do you notice when you look at the sun? And you'd say, what do you mean? I'd say, oh, tell me, what, do you, what, what is the sun? What, what do you make you feel? And you'd say, well, it's big. And I'd say, and you, I'm small. And um, it's powerful. And you, I'm weak. You'll learn that when you look at the sun and it teaches you things. All of the sun's teachings are clear. All the lessons are dear. They're simple, they're fun. We just have to learn by following the co this course of the sun. So let's start where it starts. First thing we do is we sit in a round with our legs crossed on the ground. We place our hands flat on our mother earth's back. And if you do that in the summer, you'll feel her heartbeat. It feels like a drum. It's your own heartbeat because she is our mother. With closed eyes side by side and our hearts open wide, we're many, and yet we're one. We're just waiting for the sun. And here it comes. When the sun rises, it rises in the east. On our medicine wheel, what color is it? Yellow. What animal walks into the pack with her head bowed in reverence? Not because she's afraid of the, the pack leader. She might be able to, to kill the pack leader, but she knows that the family is more important than she is. What animal is that? It's the wolf. We associate the wolf with that first teaching. Bow your head and know that you're small in the greater spe spectrum of things. You, would you like a, a grain of sand on the beach and be humble? Be humble. That's the first teaching is humility. And when we were born, every one of us was born with humble. Not one of us came out of our mother's womb and looked at the world and said, all right, man, I'm going to rock this place. That's not the way it went. We came out of our mother's womb and we looked around and we said, oh, man, it's huge. The color in the east is yellow. The teaching is humility. The wolf is my teacher who reminds me to be humble. And we associate one of the four sacred plants with each of the directions of the medicine wheel. And the plant that we associate with the east is sweet grass, the hair of my mother the hair of mother earth. And for anybody who needs to know, and again, for most of the indigenous people among us, and a lot of our kids don't know this, we use it for protection. We use the hair of mother earth for protection. I keep it, I've got a braid on my flutes. I've got one in my suitcase when I travel. I always have one in my office above every door in my shack. And I'll show you in a momentarily. I have one and it says, mother, if anything is good for me and my family, allow that. And if it's not, please keep it away. And as a very quick story, if you're in the bush and a bear comes out with her cub, you know what you do? You leave. If you're in the bush and a moose comes out with her calf, you leave. There is nothing as dangerous as, as a mother who's protective of her baby. When I was a school principal and a mother used to walk into the school and I could see she was really mad, I left. I'd call the vice principal and I'd say, Cynthia, someone's here for you. I've got a meeting. And I would leave. Do not mess with an angry mother. We use sweet grass for protection. All right, let's start there. East, yellow, wolf, humility, sweet grass. We were born there and our lives go, as does the sun, goes from east to south. And when the sun is at its zenith, that's when you're 25 years old. You can raise your arms and you'll be able to say, I'm strong. I can do anything I want to do. I can be anything I want to be. And that's the time you look to Raven. Raven, who's the only bird that can succeed, that can live in the Arctic because Raven uses the gifts the creator gave her. She uses her wit and her cunning. And that's how I succeeded. And that's what you have to do. You've got to be honest with yourself. Here we go. Watch this. Oh, God, I even read that. We're small and we're weak. We're like the wolf, yet unique. 
We're humble. It's fun when we learn from the sun. The sun rises each day in the east as we pray. It's huge, so strong. We're not big. That's wrong. Now, when the sun is in the west and the south, it's red on my medicine wheel. The color red comes there. I look to Raven. Why? I have to be honest with myself. I want all these things. I want to be rich and famous, but I have to be honest. What gift do I have? Be honest with yourself. Don't build your life around other things. Don't fool yourself. What are you? Build your life around the gift creator's given you. I kid you not. Someday I'm going to find myself there in spirit world. A creator will come to me and say, David, welcome. And I'll say, creator, I'm so, so thrilled and happy to be here. And creator will say, did you use the gift I gave you? And I'm going to say, oh, man, I wanted to talk to you about that. Creator, for openers, you made me a storyteller. So I was always talking and I was always in trouble at school. And then you made me dyslexic and school was really, really hard for me. You know, I love hockey. They make a lot of money. Did you ever think about me making me a hockey player? And Creator is going to say, David, shut up. Do I believe that? Of course I do. I was created in her likeness. So, of course, we must have the same sense of humor. Be honest with yourself. The color in the South is red. My teacher is Raven. Raven teaches me honesty. And I burn tobacco so I can open that channel to my creator. Tobacco, the most important of the four sacred plants. I'll burn that tobacco so it opens the channel towards the heavens and allows me to communicate with my creator. Help me be honest, creator. Thank you for my gift. When the sun's south we see, we have gifts, you and me. We're unique. There's one of us, just one, just one, everyone. And we learn that from the sun. When we look to the west where the sun goes to rest, we are taught to respect from the old to the nest. As the sun moves towards the west and sets on the medicine wheel, it's black or dark blue in the west. And there I look to Buffalo who runs across the plains and she doesn't step on little nests or little birds. She doesn't. She's bigger and she's strong, but she knows in the eyes of our creator, we're all equal. Don't use, don't abuse others on that journey from when you were 20 to when you're gonna be 50 to get where you wanna go. Never, ever use others, step on others. You be respectful as is Buffalo. The color in the west is black. My teacher is Buffalo and Buffalo teaches me respect. And the third of the sacred plants to us as indigenous people, as you know, is cedar. It's the only plant in British Columbia that's green all day long. Creator made it that way. It must be special. And here where I live in the lands of the Esquimalt and the Songhees, they use it to build our clothes and they use it in floors in their homes. They use it in ceremony as we do with so many of our plants. Want to try it? So with students, I would go like this and I do it all the time. Let's look to the West. What color is it? And they'll say yellow. I'll say teacher. And they'll say wolf. And I'll say teaching. And they'll say humility. And I'll say plant. And they'll say sweet grass. And then I'll say to the South, they'll say red, animal, raven, teaching, honesty, plant. And they will say tobacco, the most sacred of the plants. When you look to the West, they'll say black. And I'll say animal, bison, the buffalo. And I'll say, yes, what's the buffalo teach me? Respect. And what plant do you associate with Western Canada? And they will say cedar. And then finally, Turn here, and then we turn to the north and our courage comes forth. Barren landscape or white as is my beard. We find the strength to do right. This is when at my age, I don't mind being honest and I don't mind anybody getting mad at me. If I make a mistake, it's an honest mistake and I'm aware of that. So I have to be courageous like bear. I want to lead this world in a better place than I came into it. I want it to do it for children, for my Isabel, for my little girl. I want it for my granddaughter. I want this, so I need the courage of that bear. The color in the north is white. Bear gives me the courage I need. And before I go meet my creator, I take the fourth of the sacred plants and I smudge. I take that sage and I cleanse myself for that meeting. And I say, creator, please let my mind be open to all thoughts you'd like me to. Let my, my mouth never speak any words that would hurt any of your children. I know we're all one. And let my eyes only see those things you'd like them to fall upon and let my heart be one with yours. I smudge with that fourth plant. And that fourth plant, of course, is sage. Color is white. My teacher is bear. Bear teaches me courage and sage is the plant. All of a sudden, I've covered the four directions of the medicine wheel. And that is very important. And for us as Anishinaabek people, the seven gra the, the grandfathers gave us seven teachings. And I'm going to race through the last three because I know that I'm going to be running out of time. And you can see this is the shortened version of my seven sacred teachings that is um, in various languages. This one is only in Ojibwe and in English. Oh, it's also in French. So let's go up. Turn your head high to our father, the sky. 
you'll hear Beaver advise that you have to be wise. Beaver uses the gifts that she was given. Do you know what happens to Beaver if she doesn't have wood to work her teeth on? Yeah, they'll grow through and she'll die. She needs to work her teeth. Do you have the ability? Will you use the gift creator gave you or are you just going to die not having used it? We are told to look down. Mother Earth is the ground. She's the tree. She's the snow. She's where we're from and she's where we'll go. And that is the truth. That's why she's my mother. Then finally, the most important, it really is the most important, which is why Eagle plays such a prominent part in our, in our collective culture. Then we look deep inside in our heart, Eagle flies. She's up there above and she teaches us how to love. And the first teaching that Eagle gives us is that teaching of love and you have to love yourself. And friends, I don't know how many people out there in Canada don't love themselves. And I have to tell you that if you don't learn to love yourself, You'll never love anybody else with the depth that you should. You have to allow your students to look in the mirror and say, there's only me, there'll only be me, fall in love with me. We have to take them on that journey and help them see the gift that they've been given and then they can fall in love with themselves and then they can live the life that they should around Eagle's teaching of love. You can learn how to live, when to take and when to give. And you'll find that it's fun when you learn from the sun. Excuse me, and I'm going to stop my share and get back to, because I've been asked to leave uh, leave you um, 15 minutes, and I'm, I've already cut into that for questions and comments. So, if you'll allow me, what I tried to do with you this morning is I always start with the four things. I started with the land recognition, and I, I cut in, and I said, by the way, it's uh, International Women's Day, and we know we know the power of women in our cultures as Indigenous people in our homes, in our communities. Uh, and then I went on to uh, land recognition. And the second thing I did is I invited those children from residential schools who were murdered. And there must be a softer word, but there, there shouldn't be. They were murdered to join us for this time that we're spending together. And then I spoke briefly of mental health. And then I spoke briefly of the fact that every one of our students is unique. Everybody has a special gift from our creator. And our job is to build our lives around that. I almost missed the boat. I was 46 years old. And I haven't now I spend my whole life talking, by the way, just talking is a is a problem in school, but out in the world, when I'm in an elevator, I'm a little bit like Brent. Hey, you, where are you from? What are you doing? Oh, yeah, you want to have a coffee? You know, we, we are we're talkers because it's a gift that is given to us by our creator. And then, of course, I shared the book with you. I spoke a little bit about uh, Meet Your Family. It's one of my other stories. And then I spoke uh, briefly to um, to to this book. And it's we learn from the sun. And it's it's the truth. We do learn from the sun. There, by the way, there's a sequel because for every teaching, there's an opposite, right? And so I've written something called Deceiver, the seven deceivers. And the seven deceivers uh, are the seven cardinal sins. If you if you were brought up Catholic I, as I was, gluttony, uh, envy, wrath. I don't know to name them all, but um, um, the reality is that I, I live them all <laughs> almost every day. I know them. Uh, so there is a sequel to this called uh, this dream catcher. That's why we were given the dream catcher. So we could catch those in our dream. Okay. Well, so are there any questions about anything at all? Could be about the flutes. Obviously I could talk to you about my flutes forever. It could be about uh, how the Brent's beard is black and mine is white. You're welcome to do that. Of course. And I see Brent right there. Hey. Good afternoon. Or should I should say good morning. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Bouchard, wow. You know what? When I was listening to your uh, the children, the children book that you wrote, I like yeah. the poetry. <sighs> Isn't that true, man? I, I, I love the poetry. I mean, it's so, it, it, just, it just flows. Everything is just perfect about it. And, and You know, Brent, the truth about, about uh, rap, which is why I, I like rap. And I do most of the writings I do with a little rhythm and rhyme. And if I were your age, I'm not kidding you. I'd be a rapper. There's like, tell me you love me. The problem is when you rap at my age, Brent, some kid's going to see me and they're going to call 911 and they're going to say, hurry, get over here. There's an old man having a seizure. <laughs> so I try to stay, but mostly everything I write has got a little bit of rhythm and rhyme and it's to help my readers become readers because when you find that kind of writing, you know, it, it makes it a little easier, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, Brent, I was speaking to a high school in, in uh, Toronto yeah. and I, I shared with them my love story. I said, I wrote uh, my wife a 52 page poem 
a love story. And it sounds a little bit like this. My heart again is beating and my world is a new meaning that these weakened eyes can clearly see the colors that were meant for he whose youth can only let him hope and dream of someday finding a woman like you. And my heart, I can feel it beating. You brought new life and meaning to these aging hands that seem to me so foreign. They must surely be my father's or one ages me. No, not my touch had not served me until I first touched you. The rules of love. Oh, yeah, they're well defined. It's a thesis meant for princes and for men clearly in their prime. A time not meant for, for men like me who've lived the best years of his life and stepped through love's revolving door. But Vicky, I, I just never planned on you. So I shared this story with the kids. And when I was leaving the school, there was this big Iranian boy in grade 12 waiting for me. And he said, Hey, Miss Bouchard, uh, we know when you were talking about poetry, I thought I'd write my girl a few lines. And uh, I tried, and it's not happening for me. And I said, son, uh, I don't think poetry really happens for everybody. And, if, and he said, no, no, you don't get it. I need a few words for my girl. And I said, no, you don't get it. I mean, I don't write a love story for your girl. You got to write it. He said, okay, okay, I'll pay you. <coughs> and I said, what? He said, uh, I'll pay you. And, you know, most people think as, a, as an elder, as, a, as a, a principal, as a teacher, I'd say, oh, no, no, there's no money in this. So I said, I said, how much you pay? The kid went into his pocket. Brittany came up with a $20 bill and he said, 20? I said, sure. For 20 bucks, I'll write anybody a few lines. So I went into the staff room and I took out a paper towel and I wrote a few lines. And when I was leaving the school, the kid was standing by my, my car, my rental, and he had a $20 bill and he was going like that. And I said, okay, listen, it's in my pocket here. I'm going to read it to you. Don't poo-poo it. It's very short. Let me read it first. He said, I won't poo-poo it, man. I won't poo-poo it. So I took it out of my pocket and I, I read it and it said, roses are red, violets are blue. I'm listening to a poet, but I'm dreaming about you. And there's nothing wrong. With, there's nothing to say that roses are red or violets are blue. Or that I just can't, maybe I just can't stop dreaming about you. And the kid leaned over, took it out of my hands, handed me the 20 and he walked away. And as he walked away, Brent, he looked at me and said, I know I love her and I'm pretty sure I love you too, man. I love you too, man. I don't. <laughs> okay. Um, and then I see. Oh, thank Mar you very much. That, that is awesome. I see a note from Marianne, and it says, "Thank you, uh, Marianne. You're so welcome. It was my pleasure. I'm thrilled to be able to spend the day with you. I wish I was there in the north." Um, but again, you, you've heard me say because of this this stupid COVID, I have had a chance to reach out to and spend a lot of time with communities that otherwise I wouldn't have. And I really, really like that. You know, I can work with five or six kids on a Zoom conference, and it's. It's nice to be able to see them as I can see Brent now and as I can see some of you and be able to inter interchange ideas. And uh, this COVID has done some things for us. And as Brent said earlier, the whole hygiene thing, it's kind of made us a better world for that. And it's just, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I'm going to read a comment that we have from one of our audience members. And uh, it says, just to, just have to say, I'm working at, at home with a sick, 18 month old and she was captivated by the story she was glued to the screen what That's more can you mean. ask for that thank you very much made my day yeah uh, thank you very much for that so uh we do have some i, I want to ask you a question about your flutes uh quickly tell us one of your most treasured flutes that you have i noticed that on the wall on your amazing wall there there was like yeah, a, yeah. a line there there was like a more than a few but tell us Give us, uh, pick one out and tell us which one is your most cherished one. Well, now, you know that you open that can of, can of worms and you're in trouble, Brad. <laughs> you know, uh, when I was young and we used to buy guitars, they said some, the guys got gas and gas stood for ga a guitar acquisition syndrome. Cause you always have to have two or three or four guitars. <laughs> Same applies to my flutes. So just so you know, the, the, the coolest story that I've got related to my flutes took place in Moosini. Uh, I was in Cochrane and all of the educators from Moosini and Moose Factory had come uh, to Cochrane for this conference. And I had a number of flutes and a young woman called Shelly came over and she said, I really like that flute and I'd like to buy one of those flutes. And I said, you're welcome to. I'm, uh, I'm, the, I'm selling them for a friend of mine who lives down uh, southern Ontario. And she said, oh, yeah, I just I don't have any money here. And I said, there's an ATM machine. She said, I don't have a card here. And I said, well, what were you thinking of? So I wasn't sure. I just thought I'd talk to you. I said, well, why don't you take the flute and I'll give you his address and then you pay him the 200 bucks later. And she said, okay. So Brent, what happens is the guy called me, he said, uh, and I see, I think I sold four of your flutes. One of them is kind of interesting because she didn't, she didn't have any money or a card for the ATM. So I gave her the flute. She's going to send you the money. And he said, what's your name? And I said, I don't know. 
She said, you don't know her name. I said, no. So what happens if she never sends me the money? And I said, I don't know. Okay. Two months later, he gets a letter and it said, dear Makwa, my name is Shelly. And I bought a flute that I'm really loving. It's a branch flute that I'm really loving. But the, the interesting thing is that in the world that I live in, people don't operate that way. And this Métis just gave it to me and said, send him the money. And I just, I didn't, I, I, I've never been trusted that way. And it just, it just threw me off. And I'm just so, so thrilled with all of that. And also we started to do that, Brent. So now when I would go out, I'd say to people, here's the flute, pasty when you get a minute. <coughs> and that is cool. So these are made up from a branch. This is a piece of sumac he found in the ditch and it's been burnt. And he made it to, to look like one of my books. And you can see there, at, well, that's like a totem, I think. And Wow, that's amazing. Isn't it? That is amazing. Okay. I'm going to read two more comments and then I'm okay. going to say goodbye to you. Not, I, I shouldn't say goodbye, but I'll see you later. Uh, one is from uh, Chanel Skunk. Thank you, David. I really enjoyed listening to your stories and you're really a great storyteller. And Thank also you, another comment. Thank you for your passion. Mainstream calls that innovation. Please accept my LinkedIn invitation. So you already got, you're gaining more fans, David. You're gaining more fans. It's all we ladies need as we get older. It's Jamingwich, David Bouchard, ladies and gentlemen, a member of the Martin clan, also a Facebook market shopper and flute player and collector, ladies and gentlemen. Nice, wonderful round of applause for David Bouchard. You're very Thank welcome. you again pleasure. for joining us, David. It's been a pleasure and I really enjoyed the stories and Thank you. I just you're just so welcome, right? It was my pleasure. Thank you, Nan, for including me in this. Good luck to all of you, especially the women on this special day. Oh, yes, it is a special day. Play the win code, ladies and gentlemen. Don't forget to write this down. The word uh, play the win code is story. So now we are going to break for lunch. Uh, the break is we'll be back at 1215. So lunch is right now 1145 to 1215. We got about half an hour. And then we're going to come back with our student panel. So ladies and gentlemen, Go get your lunch. Make sure you have some fried bologna, fried click, and some toast. And throw some eggs in there. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back. Enjoy your lunch. See you on the flip side. This is Brent. I'll be right back. <laughs>